Well, hey, good evening, gardening friends. Uh, it's a little late for me to be doing a live stream, so this is probably going to be a shorter one, but I um, wanted to take you along as, you know, trying to diagnose uh, what's going on with my peppers. So let me show you what I'm talking about. So this actually started the other night, maybe two nights ago. I noticed like this like white stuff that was on the leaves and then even on the the pot bottom of the pots there. See all that? It's lice, right? It looks like you know it could be construed that way. Hey Frank, what's up, man? There's more on uh, this one here. See all that? What is all that stuff, right? So anyway, I did some checking and um, turns out the plants do have, you know, quote unquote lice, plant lice, right? Or uh, AKA aphids. So I've got aphids, a little bit of uh, infestation on my peppers here, and just kind of scratching my head like, how did that happen? You know, I, I'm using a sterile potting mix. Um, the only kind of X factor is the worm castings that I got from the uh, grow center, but who knows? Um, anyway, I've got aphids or plant lice that has uh, taken up residence on my pepper plants. So there's a couple things we can do about that. One is I can just simply take my fingers and run them over all the leaves and just squash the heck out of them. You can try to get rid of them that way. Two, I could blast them off with a spray bottle with water and sometimes that's enough to dislodge them, even kill them, because they're kind of fragile, soft-bodied organisms. Um, three, I could use like neem oil or some kind of essential oils. It's like a mixture of like pepper or, or uh, peppermint. Yeah, diametaceous, diametaceous earth is another option I could use on that. So um, earlier this evening I've got diluted um, it's basically thieves oil cleaner where you take a couple drops of thieves oil and mix it with water it's a really good cleaner for like the kitchen. So I decided to try that and kind of blasted the uh, growth tips of the plants and maybe there was you know I killed some of them but Coming back down tonight, it looks like there's more that have crawled up and taken residence. So maybe it's going to be the diametaceous earth, or maybe it's going to be just me coming along and squishing the heck out of them. All right? What do you think, Frank? What should I do? Yeah, you know, another option is I could just throw these plants away and just not worry about it. <laughs> uh, well, we don't want to do that. <laughs> right, just throw them away, start over. There's a bunch right there in, that, in the crux. They like to get in the growth tips. And get lodged in there and start sucking the, the sap from the plants they can reading up on them they can stunt plant growth they can spread some disease I guess there's like 4,000 varieties of these things and I actually think that maybe I got two types because there's like seems to be like a white and a green it's a diametaceous earth all right. Well, I think I'll, I'll need to pick some up from the store. Maybe I can get some from Tom. But 
But I mean, look at all that. And the challenge is, uh, you know, these are out at the greenhouse too. Some of my peppers have the uh, have the plant lice going on out at the greenhouse, and so we went out there tonight with the thieves spray and sprayed them down. But I, given what I'm seeing tonight on these, I'm probably gonna have to go out there tomorrow and like powder them. You know, do something different. Fortunately, it's not like huge. I mean, it's just some select plants that they seem to have taken resonance on. They're, they've not spread to the tomatoes at all. Um, anything like that. Oh, which I got to get something here. I'll be right back. Yeah, that's what I was wondering, and I'm I'm kind of wondering was it the worm castings that I got? Um, was it maybe just you know bringing some stuff in from the garden? I don't know, but uh, there's a couple theories on pests. Typically, if you see a pest there's a chance that there's probably a deficiency in the garden. Like there's a reason why the pest is there, right? Um, there's a reason why the disease is there. Um, and at the root of it is the biology of the soil is not right. No, we didn't bring um, any whole plants in from the greenhouse to from here like I've started everything here and then taken them to the greenhouse and these aphids were on here before we brought home the plants this weekend we got at the grow center so I'm not the only other thing I can think is I didn't wash out my trays real good at the end of the season so I'm kind of wondering if maybe there were some eggs or there was something and they they hatched and crawled up into the plants that's a that's a possibility But typically, if there's a pest or something, there's something's out of balance. Yeah, I'm thinking it's aphid eggs. Um, so lesson learned. I'll just we got the pressure washer fixed at my dad's. I'll make sure I pressure wash all my trays. Anything I'm gonna be bringing back to the house. Try to just clean everything up. Sanit, you know, keep it sanitary. Um, but. It's, um, reading up on aphids and some people think that maybe one reason why uh, they tend to gravitate to plants is if there's an excess of nitrogen um, you know they're there as like a limiting factor to try to slow down the plant growth like they're attracted to it um, could be who knows um, interesting theory anyway and then elsewhere I've read you know the soil biology is correct um, you eliminate a lot of your problems right there because the plants are getting everything they need and yeah or it could be lack the lack of a predator like ladybugs right that's what I should probably do is see if I can catch some ladybugs if there's any around and put them in here on these plants and they would just they'd go to town and gobble up the aphids um, so I know a couple options. I think I'm going to try the dust next since the uh, spray, maybe the spray is just not strong enough, like it's too diluted, so it's not really affecting them. It seemed like it worked really well on the, uh, on the ants, you know, initially like killed them on contact, but, um, and maybe it did that with these aphids, but there was more that came up and I've kind of taken resonance on the plant, so it's kind of frustrating. 
But today, so my wife, they were cleaning out the uh, cabinets and stuff upstairs and basically organized all the canning jars. So like we're getting prepared for uh, canning season and all that upcoming, but they found a box and inside the box it looked like this there's a little bag on top and when they lift the bag they found the seeds that I've been missing the seeds that I thought were lost are now found and I was pretty excited about that because we had some pretty good tomatoes last season like really healthy looking and so I got seeds from a bunch of healthy looking stuff I got seeds from the ancient watermelon that was really awesome looking so I got those I've got Dester again and this I know this is Dester because I had labeled the jar the ones that I started here were from a season when the jars got kind of mixed up I didn't label them just was going by the color of the pulp and stuff and I think I mixed them up but I know this is Dester happy about that got more pink brandy wine happy about that terracotta I don't know did I send you these seeds I think I sent you some terracotta These are the ones from Baker Creek that they're like four or five bucks a packet and you only get like maybe 10 seeds or something. I got a bunch in here. Really good tomato. I'll have to, I've got pictures. I'll send you a picture that compares the main varieties. I got True Black Brandy Wine again. I've got, this was a really good one. This was a a Zoichka. I got that from MI Gardener last year and it was it performed like really well in the cool climate. I didn't have any of those seeds this year to start so I've got them again. Uh, worst case scenario we'll start some next year on that. And then I've got yeah that's a tomato it's a I think it's from like the Ukraine or like northern climate so they has got a lot shorter like maybe six, 70 days to maturity or something. It was one of the earlier ones, similar to like True Black Brandywine. I got these pretty early on. And they were as prolific, like throughout the whole season, I was getting these for the most part until it got to about like September, October. The vines started dying out around September, I think. So they didn't hang on as long as some of the varieties, but they were really good. Um, this really nice variety and then I got Italian paste this is a tomato that um, my wife's uncle gave me two years ago I saved seeds from it we planted them last year um, they did pretty well I got some really nice it's like a giant sized Roma with a little curved tip on the end real meaty um, so I saved seeds from the best ones there. So I've got a tie and paste again. So super excited. Yeah, I was just excited that I got these seeds that they didn't get thrown away, that they're not missing. Uh, so I'm going to put them in the refrigerator, and hopefully that's that's good. So super excited about that. Um, let's see what else is going on. Guess on a, uh, it's kind of neat, I didn't share this with you because I know uh, you're studying and stuff like that, the scriptures and, and all that, and believer. Um, but every once in a while, well, not every once in a while, it's more often than not, but a lot of times the way the Lord will kind of teach me and stuff like that is like he'll lay a verse or a thought or something um, that ties into a verse just kind of lay something on me 
And uh, so for the last two mornings, I guess kind of what came to mind was um, the, it's a part of a verse. Um, it's actually in uh, Proverbs 23, 7. And I shared this with a co-worker at work today, and it's pretty neat. And um, But anyway, it says, uh, basically, as a man thinketh in his heart, so he is, right? And uh, the greater context of that verse is Solomon's, like, counseling his son against the miser, you know, eating bread at the miser's house that, you know, hey, he says eat and drink, but his heart's not with you, you know, beware, basically, um, you know, um, the offer of food and drink is not genuine, you know, that's really, like, the guy's heart's not right about it, he's, he's a miser, he's stingy, um, his heart's not with you, but then, like, another aspect of that is, uh, just the idea that, you know, um, you are who you are based on kind of like the attitude of your heart, you know, which is also can be influenced by, you know, what it can be a reflection of, um, or, um, you know, your thoughts can be a reflection of what's really going on in your heart and kind of where you're at with things, right? And there's all kinds of scriptures and stuff that talk about, like, guarding your heart, you know, with all diligence. I think that's, like, in Proverbs 4, um, you know, because out of it springs the issues of life I and mean, just how important that is. So anyway, that kind of got me thinking. So the last two days, that was kind of like the phrase, and I guess really the main takeaway is that, you know, pay attention to what you're thinking about. It's kind of an indication of maybe where you're at um, in terms of the attitude of your heart, where you're at with the Lord. And if you find yourself, you know, off course or whatever, the key is to write, you know, like it says in 1 John 1, 9, right? If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just. Forgive us our sins, cleanse us of all unrighteousness, right? And it's not a matter of if we're going to sin, it's going to be when, and so, and you can, you know, in your thinking, it can lead you down a, a bad path. And you can get a bunch of head trash um, by just living in this world, right? You're supposed to live in the world but not be of it. It's real easy to be influenced by the world and let those things kind of creep in. And then you become uh, spiritually dull, you know, because by nature we tend to be lazy and we tend to drift we tend to um, cater to like our flesh and like comfort and choose the uh, path of least resistance and all that type stuff. And so it's it can be easy to get dull and to get lazy and kind of start drifting. And then next thing you know, um, you're not where you really should be. You're off course, you know, and you come to your senses and then realize, like, oh. So anyway, that was kind of the, some of the takeaways, at least so far, as I've been kind of chewing on that, meditating on it a little bit, you know, and kind of taking inventory, you know, like, um, what is the attitude in my heart, you know, towards my job, towards my family, towards uh, the Lord, you know, and what I think about Him. Yeah, some all kinds of applications, you know, to that, and, you know, scriptures are clear, you know, I think it's like in uh, Philippians 4a, it talks about, you know, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's excellent, whatever's praiseworthy, you know, think on such things, right, like, um, Colossians 3, 2 talks about, you know, setting your mind on things above, you know, not on earthly things, you know, as far as, like, the attitude of your heart and, like, and the thing is, is, like, it takes a uh, conscious effort, um, you know, one, to be aware of it, which is something the Lord kind of reveals to you, right, and then points you in a direction, and then with His help helps you uh, he renews your mind, right? Like it says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, like, uh, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, well, 
what does the renew? It's the Holy Spirit by the Word of God, right? It renews our mind and like helps us to test and approve God's will, His good, pleasing, perfect will. It helps us to discern what we're to do. It helps us to test, you know, test things and hold on to the good, you know, hold fast to the good. Those things that are good, that are proven, that are um, that the Lord approves of. So anyway, that's kind of where I'm at. That's kind of what um, this kind of been mulling over the last two mornings, really. And it's kind of, I guess, uh, making sense to me today, just kind of thinking about all that. And it's kind of a wake-up call, right, to be watchful, alert, you know, and um, kind of pay attention to that and if it's you know starts to drift or whatever or it was not where it should be then really the answer is to look to the Lord like oh okay you know and start spending time um, abiding you know it's kind of like it said in John 15 about you know how it, he's a vine where the branches right and abiding in him remaining in him you know so that we bear much fruit so that we we stay um, connected, at least on our end, right? It's not that the Lord loses us or anything like that, but we can become an enemy in our own mind um, against the Lord about things because of how things are shaping and whatnot. And, um, you know, we're like sheep and we can go astray, you know, and then he, the Good Shepherd comes and gets us. <laughs> You know, brings us back and helps us and teaches us and and uh, shows us how much he loves us, right? So anyway, some Tuesday night musings, kind of what's been going on. What about you, ma'am? What, anything, uh, any revelations or anything you've been kind of meditating on, mulling over? Yeah, that is a really fun topic, and that it's a topic that has resulted in several denominations and church splits and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> um, and not that I, I've got a good answer and whatnot. I thought kind of what um, J. Vernon McGee presents is kind of interesting, the idea that the Lord chooses or predestines on the basis of foreknowledge. You know, the fact that He knows everything. Um, then, you know, He can make that determination. Um, and yet we have free will. And it's it's a paradox, really. Like, how can that be possible for us to have free will on choice? And yet, at the same time, to be chosen. Um, it's a difficult, it can be kind of difficult. I guess, uh, and I think the example he, he gave was about, you know, walking through, like it's, you know, it's whosoever will is written over the the gates of heaven, so to speak, or the door, you know, as you're, you're going in. And then when you turn, but once you're in, you look back it's something like you were chosen right so it's kind of a, a paradox but i guess you know um god choosing on the basis of his foreknowledge yeah it kind of makes sense you know if he knows every has perfect knowledge like nothing's a mystery then like he already knows how we're going to choose and because he's omnipotent omnipotent and all-powerful He's still able to work all things together, like to accomplish his plans and purposes. Um, and gives us, you know, it's genuinely a choice, like where we can, we can choose.
Yeah, there's um, um, that guy, Chuck Missler, that I mentioned. Yeah, his whole catchphrase and all his programs would be like, you know, um, God exists outside our time domain. Like, he sees it all at once outside of it. Um, you know, and there's, ver there's passages that allude to that. There's... Um, I think it's in Ephesians there. It talks about he chose us before the foundations of the world, right? Um, there's a passage in Revelation referring to um, Christ that when they're, it's like, behold, the lamb who was slain from before the foundations of the earth. You, the idea that um, God's plan of redemption and all that was, it was already determined, planned out, like the Lord knew he knows the end from the beginning, the beginning from the end. And again, it's something that we don't, in like a finite existence, completely understand, right? Um, but there's an interesting passage, I think it's in 1st uh, or 2nd Corinthians, I think. Uh, I'm trying to remember. Anyway, Paul talks about seeing through a glass darkly. You know, how we, we know in part, you know, prophesy in part, you know, but basically once we see him face to face, once, you know, we're with him, we're going to know as we're known. Like we're going to have a, a knowledge that, and what's kind of interesting about that is like that's kind of what, going back to like the Genesis story, that was the temptation or the appeal that... Um, You know, Satan presented to Eve, right? That, you know, well, you do this, you're going to be like God. You're going to know um, good and evil. You're going to have knowledge, right? And um, she saw that it was pleasing for knowledge. It's kind of how that ties in, like, you know, that ultimately that's going to be fulfilled as far as we're going to know as we are now. We're going to have a, I don't know. It's not something we think a lot about because, like, we're living in this world and, like, you know, doing our thing and preoccupied with what we can see, touch, you know, taste, feel. Um, but there's more to it than that, right? Um, yeah. I mean, I can see it both, both ways. And it's one of those things, I guess, um, boy, I'd, her long ago is like when you come across it in the scriptures, you know, like verses that seem to teach one one side of the coin versus the other as far as the free will versus predestination type stuff. You just teach whatever's presented, you know, in the plainest view, and then when you get to the next one, that's maybe obviously that you teach that. <laughs> Yeah, we get their publications. Um, my father-in-law, somebody had signed him up for it years ago because my uh, my father-in-law's, I would say, probably agnostic. Um, maybe at best a deist. And um, I remember when we first met, this is like years ago and whatnot, and he was talking with me and just asking me about Stuff and I started talking about the Lord and this and the other. Um, he's like, "Well, there's two problems I have with um, Christianity," and I was like, "Really?" He's like, "Yeah, um, Jesus rising again from the dead. I've got a problem with that. Like, didn't happen. That didn't happen." Um, he said, "The in the Bible being the inspired Word of God. No, nah, it was just written by men." <laughs> So needless to say, we've had interesting conversations over the years on all kinds of stuff. Evolution um, seems to be the big one um, that he likes to hang his hat on and stuff like that. Um, I don't know. It's been interesting over the years. He's up in his 80s now, and um, I think maybe 82, something like that. Um, 
And we got mutual respect. Like, I mean, I, you know, we pray for him and stuff like that. Um, and he's real curious. I mean, he's got subscriptions to all kinds of learning stuff. He's always listening, always learning. Um, he's got time to do that. He's kind of semi-retired. And so uh, usually well-read and study all kinds of stuff. Um, and I've... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're not perfect, we're forgiven. And it's really easy to get soured on, um, like, organized religion. CBNO. <laughs> What's that stand for? Yeah. Yeah, it's true. <clears throat> there's there's a lot of a lot of that out there. But there are some great resources, you know, I have conversations and stuff like that. Um Lee Strobel's got some pretty good some interesting books on um, different stuff. I guess he was, I think, a reporter for the Chicago Tribune or whatever, investigative reporter. Did stuff. I think he went to, I'm trying to think of the name of the place, Willow Lake or Willowbrook Church or whatever it was, investigating the faith and all, all that. Ultimately, um, yeah, yeah, he wrote that and uh, Case for Creation, a couple other stuff. Um, so pretty reason, um, stuff, there's another guy, I think Ken Ham, he's the one that does the whole creation museum, um, in Cincinnati with the Ark and all of that stuff. Actually, it's outside of Cincinnati, I think it's in Kentucky. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff. There's a, another one, uh, Josh McDowell. He's got some decent stuff. Uh, more than a carpenter. It's like a uh, apologetics type stuff. Um, and then there's various strands because like there's a, I guess creationism that's more literal view of things. And there's intelligent design which is maybe a step back from that but still acknowledges like a creator and there's some good stuff there I guess there's a guy named Michael Behe he's got a book called Darwin's Black Box that's kind of interesting um, I don't know it's been years it's been a while since I've read some of that stuff but um, I don't know ultimately I think um, you know just reading the Bible, right? Um, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. I think just reading through that and um, understanding, like, getting a grasp of the Scriptures and stuff like that has really helped, you know, over the years. And um, just taking it slow and kind of going through different things. There's just a ton there. I mean, you can read through it, you know, at one level just to understand kind of the facts and the content and then you can kind of go through it another time and then other things start jumping out you know and it becomes more um, instead of just observing the facts it becomes more of an application standpoint where huh and you start to kind of see the cause and effect relationship of like faith and obedience and in different truths that are in there and then you know reading through it and you get to the point where you're it's more um was it observation interpretation 
application. I think it's kind of the three steps of like an inductive approach. So, you know, observe, see the facts, uh, who, what, when, where, why, how. Um, then you start to interpret, like, what does this mean? And in the application, what does this mean for me? You know, like, how's the Lord applying this to my life, like, where I'm at? Like, what is this, what's he saying here? How's the, how's the Spirit applying this to the situation and all of that? And then that's where you kind of, Got to be a little careful, like, what is it saying? First John, attest the spirits, you know, see whether they're from God, you know, and hold fast to the good. Because um, not every, if you're not uh, paying attention to the context and all that, it's real easy to take stuff out of context. Yeah, I think there, there's definitely, like, um, you know, laws of creation, things he's kind of set in motion, uh, spiritual laws, things like that, where um, I guess, you know, as, like, a believer and stuff like that, and, and um, Again, studying the word and kind of understanding, you know, learning about the Lord and he shows you more things and helps you to navigate, uh, I guess, walk in wisdom, you know, where you know what to do, given the circumstances, kind of gives you insight into things, um, you know, and ultimately works all things together for good, right? Um, for our good, you've been called according to his purposes and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's just me and more a study and like look into things and, and, um, and see just, it's, you know, in some respects, simple enough, like a child can grasp like the gospel message in some ways they understand it better than like an adult, you know, the fact that, you know. Oh, you know, I'm a sinner. I'm in need of God's grace. I need, I need the Lord. I need Jesus, right? And just have simple faith and trust Him. Um, trust what He's done. Um, but at the same time, you can, you can't exhaust Him. You can stay through, and there's like new things you end up seeing, and like, uh, especially like the complexity of the language, like uh, Hebrew and Greek. You know, the fact that they, um, those languages are, like, really rich in meaning, and, like, there's certain words that, you know, like, translators did the best they could, but when you actually start looking at the original languages and stuff, just the layers of meaning and how different things tie into each other, and there's all kinds of just really cool Things that you can glean, you know, doing like word study on um, different aspects of, of that. Um, trying to think of the one. Yeah, it's just really cool. You can click on words and then you can kind of get a more amplified view of what that what they're meaning, like what was the word picture they were painting. Um, it's just, yeah. It starts to become fun because you actually start discovering things, like get, gain some insights on things. Um, yeah, it's just really cool. So anyway, excited to be studying with you, man. Um, kind of going through um, Book of Ephesians together and stuff like that. Kind of listening to messages, kind of sharing takeaways, insights. Um, things like that. It's encouraging, right? And it occupies your thoughts. It's kind of like the parable of the, um, you know, Jesus 
shares this parable of the um, house that's, you know, um, occupied by, you know, a demon or something. It's cast down, goes through the arid places and whatever, and then decides to go back to the house and finds out, oh, it's, it's swept, it's clean, it's put back in order. So then he goes and gets like seven more um, evil spirits like himself and the, the condition of the man, which, you know, the house is the man. The condition of the man's worse than what it was to begin with. And it's kind of a, um, I guess the point of the story is like, you know, it's one thing to be, you know, come to the Lord, be saved and delivered. But you got to allow him to occupy that space in your life, right? You got to allow him to take up residence. And, um, and that's primarily through the study of the scriptures and being in fellowship and things like that. Because if you don't, you know, it's just religion, you know, and it's empty. And, um, you know, ultimately you, you could end up, end up, worse off than what you were before you knew anything <laughs> you know and under a uh, different influence of things and and um this is just the importance of making sure you allow him to occupy you know and, and have that empty space in your life have that you know occupy the whole house so to speak there's a little booklet it's uh my heart christ home it was kind of neat. It's kind of like a little story along that line where basically the story is that, you know, initially the Lord shows up to the house and the guy or whoever didn't initially want to let the Lord in, so kept him outside on the porch and then lets him in and he's in the, the front room and then over time starts allowing the Lord to go to different parts of the house, right, and to where the Lord is occupying the majority of the space, but there's still, um, you know, it gets to the point where it's the guy's room, and then I think underneath the bed there's a box with something in it or whatever, and ultimately he gives it all over, you know, and the Lord has his heart, so to speak. It's kind of a cool little story. But yeah, I think just being in it, and uh, it's encouraging, you know. doesn't mean we're perfect or anything like that. But, um, you know, it's not, I don't claim to know all the answers by any means. Yeah, and I'm, I guess we were sharing earlier, I'm just one beggar, you know, showing another beggar where to get bread. <laughs> hey, hey, I found some bread here. Come over here. <laughs> cool stuff you know talking about words I guess kind of uh, another thing that comes to mind you know there's a uh, passage in John 10 10 where it says you know the thief comes to steal kill and destroy but I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly and I guess the word used there is this word called zoe. And um, what it's implying there is the it's the quality of life that God has. You know, it's a quality of life that only He can give you. And um, that's kind of cool that that's, that's the kind of, of, that's the quality of life that the Lord wants to give us. You know, when we come to him, you know, um, whereas the enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy, you know, everything, anything that's good in our life, and gives the, the point we want to give up, or we get bitter, or angry, or whatever, um, the Lord wants to turn that all around, you know, to help us, and it doesn't happen overnight, but um, he is able to to turn things around and give us a quality of life that we otherwise wouldn't have. Like give us a, a peace and enjoy 
you know, grace and peace, right? Grace always comes first. God's grace realizing, you know, he's um, given us what we totally didn't expect or deserve. There's that neat little acronym. It means uh, God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. You know, and then peace follows, right? Where we, we've, which is God's gift of wholeness, where we're just... We're complete in Him because we're indwelled by His Spirit. You know, we're forgiven, we're free. He set us free from like the law of sin and death and all that. But then there comes joy, which is, you know, this abiding contentment or basically grace realized. You know, and it's that quality of life where we're just, we're at peace. There's a contentment, there's a... you know, um, we're secure, you know, in the Lord, and like we know, we know Him, right, He's with us. It's just really cool stuff. Again, like I said, you can kind of study through all that stuff, and there's just so many layers you can peel back like an onion. It's just, I don't know, it's, it's pretty amazing. Not everybody accepts that, though, of course, you know, and there's a lot of people that are offended by that. Um, you know, that's okay. It's, you just try to be an example, you know, and um, just enjoy the things that the Lord gives you, you know, and just be at peace and try to live as He calls you. Yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. And kind of going through it with other people makes it even better because it just kind of spurs you on and, and whatnot. So, so anyway, that's kind of my, my uh, two cents or musings. You had chicken and waffles. Was that right? That was Mexican. Curly dog. I don't what is that? Huh. Well, that's neat. We had um, some bacon and tomato sandwiches, but my daughter also, daughter also made, um, she called it, it was um, carrot bacon. And what it was is um, thin peels of carrot, carrot strips that was laid on a cookie sheet and seasoned and then basically roasted in the oven until it was crispy. And it's pretty good. I mean, it, it didn't taste like bacon. And I asked her, was like, well, did you put bacon in the oven? <laughs> well, I can eat carrots, but I'm really wanting some bacon. fun stuff yeah yeah <laughs> it it tastes a little bit like roasted carrots <laughs> yeah so well I think I'm gonna call it a night and try to get some 
shut eye, but we'll catch up again um, soon. You know, and uh, okay, and keep studying with you. Looking forward to uh, listening through the series and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> oh shoot! We gotta get these seeds uh, put up tonight. So anyway, um, I catch you here. We'll. Need to get your care package in the mail here. Uh, probably do that this weekend. Work's been kind of running late, you know, getting home at like um, 6.15, 6.30, stuff like that. Most of the time the um, stuff's closed and all that, but try to get uh, some things to you. So, anywho, uh, feel free to hit me up and. Uh, I'll catch you on the next uh, the next stream or uh, via text, man.